get I'll need to do one final thing to make sure that I've got everyone up. There we go. People know that pop in slowly, but um, yeah. Thank you for coming along. Uh, thank you for uh, accepting the invitation and uh, for being so kind and uh, sort of coming here and uh, wanting to talk. Um, I thought it would be nice if uh, you would like to introduce yourself. I'm quite terrible at names. I can pronounce your first name easily, but I don't want to offend you by being unable or mispronouncing <laughs> your surname. So, uh, how would you like, if you would like to introduce yourself, I think would be the best way of doing this. And then, um, yeah, we'll go from there, I think. Hey, well, I'm Larry Kaufman. I'm a grandmaster uh, in chess because I won the World Senior Championship in 2008, which automatically made me a grandmaster. Mm, mm, mm. And how, uh, how long have you been... Uh, so, here's a question to start off, I suppose. Uh, what first got you into chess and when, you know, how long have you been involved with the scene? Because from what I understand, you've been involved in chess for... Plus 50 years now, I would say, from what I could tell, looking into it. Well, more, more like 60 years, 60. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, uh, I mean, my, well, my father taught me, but basically I got into chess. Uh, I had a lesson when I was eight years old from uh, a chess master named Harold Phillips. Mm -hmm. And he, he was um, the New York champion in the year 1895. Wow. <laughs> and he played against Steinitz, the first world champion. Yes. And no. this is my this guy was my teacher. Can you imagine that? That's awesome. That's yes. A, that's awesome. <laughs> so he he gave me a lesson and that got me interested in it. And uh, um, so for a while, I you know I, I didn't have anybody yet very good to play. I played. I mean, of course, the other kids in school were even worse than I was. So <laughs> uh, my father was. He was an okay player, but not, you know, not that strong. Um, but I was very interested in it and played a lot and, and started to read books. And when I, but I didn't uh, get into organized chess till I got into high school, and oh, yeah. then I, then I learned about the organized chess scene. And my first chess tournament was in 1961, the Maryland Junior Championship, which and I came in second place. Nice, nice. I think for me, uh, like uh, when I was a kid, uh, similar, I got into like chess when uh, I was at school, uh, your version of high school in the UK, um, and yeah, I, I, but I was also fairly, I think, lucky in that, like the kids I was around, we tried to do a lot of um, fairly unusual things, so uh, now I know that what we were trying to do at one point was bug house, but at the time I didn't, but I remember we got uh, about nine, ten different boards, set them all up, and just did this massive team version of Bug House at one point, and uh, it wasn't like any proper chess club, it was just something we did on lunch breaks, etc. But uh, I, uh, I think that got me interested in not just chess, but the ways that you could experiment with chess and expand on the rule set and uh, change it around. And that in turn led me to look into Go, it led me into looking into Shogi, um, and that sort of just stayed with me for ages, till about uh, uni came up and stuff. And then uh, I've only gotten into it recently again, um, I think is the best way of doing it, yeah. How about, um, in terms of vari variance and um, your sort of deviations from the standard game, what piqued your interest in that? Because it's not the most common interest to be piqued um, in chess players, or at least from what I've encountered. It doesn't seem that the variance scene is nearly as popular, apart from perhaps 960 or potentially bug house. Um. Well, uh, I mean, I always played other games. I, I played a lot of bridge in high school, and, and I also took up Go. But um, the first real involvement I had was, I don't, I wouldn't even call it a variant, but but I, I learned Shogi in, in uh, 1977. Uh, a chess playing friend of mine just who, who had been my Go teacher insisted on teaching me shogi and I, I didn't even really want to learn it but he was the kind of person you don't say no to mm. so I, I i humored him and uh, but then i started to like it mm. and i you know i i don't think it's really appropriate to call it a variant because Great. it's it's another it's it's one of the three big branches of chess mm. Absolutely. kind of code uh, you could call it a variant of shogi just as well but <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so I, I got into that. Uh, that was during a period when I had quit playing chess to focus on my career. So I just played shogi during that 
shogi and go during that period. But uh, at first I didn't have anyone to play shogi with except this guy who taught me. And I quickly got to be stronger than he was. Mm. Then I, I really got into it. I got, I, I got a Japanese book and I couldn't read Japanese, but I could still play through the moves. Mm. And then I started to, to meet Japanese people who knew how to play. And then finally I, re, I realized uh, the best place to go in the United States to play shogi was Los Angeles. So I, I spent some time at the Los Angeles Shogi Club and got to play some actual real play, you know, real Shogi players. Game, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then I then I went to England for the international championships they had there, and I I won it both years. But they they, they didn't have you know it was it was uh, Western players. It wasn't Japanese players. So of course it's still not in very strong competition. So I thought, at that point, I said, okay, look, if I want to get into this game, i got to go to Japan. Mm-hmm. That's all there is. So I started going to Japan every year, pretty much, and playing shogi for extended periods. And uh, pretty soon, I got to be recognized as the, the top Western player of shogi, even from roughly 1980 to 2000. I was going to say, like, how, how long did you keep going up to Japan for every year? How, well, how, how, long, how long did you keep, uh, oh. how many years? Well, I, I went, I, I guess, I mean, at first it was almost every year, and then it became a little less often. I, I guess I went about, I think I went a total of 10 times. Nice. That's, yeah. that's pretty cool. But did yeah. you, so, um, in terms of like, because um, I saw, I read an article or a opinion piece you'd written in 1999, I think it was, about the main sort of elements that you think by which you can rank um, chess variants and shogi, etc. So, like, on draw percentage, I think, was one of them. I've got it written down. Draw percentage, chances of both sides in terms of how equal it is, the memorization of open theory, variety of play, the traditions and history associated with that game, game length, strategic principles, and how early each force um, engages. Um, at the time, I saw that you maintained that shogi was probably the best chess-like game. Um, around, uh, trying not to offend the Go players. And um, do you still maintain that roughly today? Would you say, or has uh, your opinion changed? I would. Uh, that would still be my opinion. I, th- I think there are um, maybe some other variants that are uh, getting uh, at least uh, closing the gap. You might say, but yeah, uh-huh. I would still put Shogi as the best. Yeah. Fair, fair, fair. Yeah, because um. Yeah, there are certainly others. I know that you also mentioned Grand Chess, which I'm very glad you did, because uh, we've played some Grand Chess on stream before, and it has been... I, I think Grand Chess is a fairly good variant myself. I think it's uh, certainly the Archbishop and Chancellor, and the fact that the Rooks in the back line are freed up, lead to quite dynamic games. Um, at least that's what I've noticed. Um, plus, I think, as you said before, the lack of opening theory kind of helps in that each game is thus a new experience to an extent um although i think with a lot of variants particularly ones which don't have the drop rule in shogi in time opening theory would become a problem uh probably i think with drops it ends up leading to such greater amount of variety because fundamentally speaking it increases a limited well i mean it just increases the potential and possibilities of any individual game um to a point beyond Beyond any human calculation, uh, maybe uh, machines can, and um, we'll probably get on to talking about uh, machines and uh, your work on Komodo and other ones in a minute. Uh, but yeah, I uh, do appreciate Shogi a lot, and I think you're correct um, in many regards. Um, so you've played normal Shogi. I know you mentioned you played Chu Shogi before. Uh, have you tried any of the other forms of it out before? The other forms of Shogi? Yes, yes. yes. Um, I played just maybe one or two games of some of the others, but not not enough to say that I didn't know how to play them. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, they're very hard to find. I found apart outside of eighty one dojo, which is, as far as I can tell, the only site to play Chu Shogi on. Um, it's basically non-existent, um, which is unfortunate. I feel. Um, but I only found Chu Shogi a few days ago. Um, in terms of other things, have you tried? There are a few variants I would like at some point, if you're willing, to um, try out uh, playing with you at some point. Uh, maybe not tonight, maybe tonight, it doesn't matter, but there are 
another interesting ones. Uh, one of the people who turns up in our chat a fair bit is a guy called... Well, he goes under the moniker of Couch Tomato, but he's developed on Pie Chess, which I sent you uh, before. He's developed three games there, including a version of Grand Chess that incorporates some of the units from Chinese chess, which is fairly interesting, including the cannon, for instance. Um, and that certainly, we found, led to some interesting games, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I did play quite a bit of Chinese chess too r r around 1990. Mm. In fact, I, I actually had, I actually had a game on on television on New York television with the champion of China. Nice. He, 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 because they, he was here touring the U.S. and they wanted to show him playing some American who didn't look Chinese. You know, they didn't, they wanted to give the avoid the impression that only Chinese people could play it. Got ya. So, and they picked me as the strongest American who didn't have any. Chinese uh, ancestry, so, uh, <laughs> so how I, uh, how, well, I mean, well, how did I do? Yeah, how'd the match go? <laughs> I lasted longer than anyone expected, that's all I can say. <laughs> got ya, got ya, got ya. I also noticed you played Korean chess before, uh, are you, I think you played Korean chess, at least yeah. for my research into it. <laughs> well, I did, I, yes, I also played Korean chess, but not I mean, the, the Chinese chess I played a lot. I, I played hundreds of games of that. The Korean chess I only played like 10 times. But I have a, a little funny story about that. When I was in Korea, I was on the US GO team. Mm -hmm. And we were just, we had some free time and we were walking around and there was a couple of guys playing Korean chess on the street corner. So when the game ended, I, I motioned that I'd like to play one of them, the, the winner. And that, nobody, we couldn't talk. He couldn't, I mean, he didn't know English and I didn't know sure. Korean, but but anyway, they. I sat down and they they started to teach, show me how to play because they didn't know if I knew or not. Mm -hmm. and, and I wasn't even sure that the game I knew was the same game because they might have different versions of Korean chess. I didn't know. But they taught me and it was the same game that I had learned. Uh, so then we then we played a game and I, it was, I suggested that maybe he better give me a, a piece handicap. He took off one of the pieces. I forgot which one now, because um, you know he he's doing this every day, and I was basically a beginner. Mm -hmm. and, and I, but I, I beat him, and everybody was astonished. So then he said, "Okay, let's you, you know yeah, let's play out a handicap now," and and I, and I beat him again, and they they were just uh, they, they were just so stunned. Yeah, and obviously the only reason I was able to win was because Korean chess is. At least somewhat like Chinese chess, and I was already a, at least a competent player. Of, got you. Of got you. Did you do you find that learning? Because did you find that it was hard to learn to such a level? The, the various different board games with different rule sets. Or did you find that um, by learning one, it increased the creativity of your play in other forms? Um, for instance, I uh, certainly some people who who began playing like Go. And well, not go, but shogi, and also a go match or two from my stream have noticed that their creativity and reliance certainly on just like formulaic openings at the start of a chess game, for instance, have has, it has been lessened and their creativity has been improved on that front there. Um, or did you find that it actually was harder after a long after focusing on different games to advance in one game? If that makes sense as a question, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it, well, it's, it's pretty clear that being good at one form of chess helps you also be good at another form. They, there is a carryover. Got you, got you. In fact, I, I, get, I got a funny story on that, too. Go for it. There, yeah. There, um, the, uh, the Shogi champion of Japan uh, uh, about 20 years ago was uh, uh, Moriuchi was his name. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had recently taken up chess. He, he just he learned it in Japan and maybe read a couple books and played some like 50 games or something, you know, mm -hmm. basically a beginner, but but he was the, the Shogi champion. And he decided he wanted to play in a chess tournament. So he, he flew over to Los Angeles, played in the American Open Chess Championship. Well, so he, in, the, in the early rounds, he was, he was able to beat the, you know, the, the ordinary players. I mean, he got paired with people with ratings like, I don't know, 18, 1900, something like that. And, managed to beat them because he, he, he had enough skill from just from Shogi that he could, you know, he could sure. play pretty, pretty well. And after a few rounds, uh, he, he finally got a, 
a tough pairing. It got paired with my friend Jack Peters, who is almost a grandmaster. He came very, very close to the GM title. And um, he totally outplayed Peters and got to a, a rook and pawn ending with an extra pawn in a, in a type of position that any strong chess player would easily win. Mm -hmm. But Moriuchi started to mess it up and, and he, he only got a draw even though it was a pretty easy win. Mm -hmm. Now, my, my friend Peters didn't know who he was playing. He just knew he was playing some Japanese guy. He didn't know who it was. So he, he maybe he, was, he thought, this is weird. You know, how could somebody yeah. outplay me and, and then play the ending like a, like a beginner? You know, and he, maybe he thought the guy was cheating or something. I don't know. But, but so he said, how, how could you possibly, you know, play that well and not, and not win that rook and pawn ending? And Moriuchi said, I've never had a rook and pawn ending before. It's the most common ending in chess. <laughs> That's so funny. But just, yeah, focus completely on it before. So never encountered it. I, I find it, uh, one of the things I find amusing on uh, YouTube is watching um, chess grandmasters go up to hustlers, for instance, in like uh, New York City, etc., who have no clue who they are, and uh, they go there and uh, play chess and just confuse them uh, until they realize how good an opponent they're playing and figure it out. But uh, it's always entertaining seeing that kind of shock at uh, learning who they're dealing with. Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of, um, so you did go, focus on that there, sorry, you did uh, chess, then you got into shogi, and from that there you moved into Chinese chess to an extent, and go presumably around the same time. Um, when did your interest in, I presume it came about as a result of shogi, but your interest in um, handicap chess, because um, that's something that you've worked on quite a lot. Um, when did that sort of arise? Um, well, that's pretty much been a lifelong interest because it, it started when, when I was basically just learning chess because my first chess book was a book of Morphy's games. Mm. And he was famous for giving handicaps. What, roughly one third of the games in the book were handicap games. So it got, my, it got me used to the idea that handicap chess is a, is a normal part of chess. It's a big... You know, I, I wouldn't have had that idea if I'd read somebody else's game. Yeah. But I got the idea from, from that. And then when I was in, in school, the, the you know, even though I wasn't yet that great a player, I was mm -hmm. still much better than the other kids. So the only way I could play it's chess with other kids them. was yeah. to get them That makes sense. Yeah. And, so, and then when I got involved with chess computers, back, back then, it, the only way to have a good game on the computer was to give it a handicap. Now it's the other way around, but uh, back then that was I had the, when I had my my first job working on a computer chess computer at MIT called it the Mac Hack program. Mm. I did it at Queen. I had to give it Queen handicap to make for a match. Yeah. So it was, it's been a lifelong thing, and uh, and I use it when when I teach chess. I give handicaps to students, and I've always been following the situation with the computers as the handicaps got smaller and smaller and then eventually started, went to where I had to get the handicap instead of giving it. <laughs> yeah, it's been such a, at least, a rapid development of the computer systems overall and just their abilities. Um, in the past, like, 20 years, it's been insane. Insane the amount of development that we uh, that computers have gone through. Um, and just technology as a whole, the acceleration of it is uh, incredible. Um, I've, been, I've enjoyed watching, I haven't watched too many, but the... Um, the various AI competitions in chess and the computer co tournaments are quite interesting just because of how the computer moves and uh, the kind of uh, yeah unusual things. I did look a bit into um, Komodo, um, the system that uh, you yourself have helped develop. Because um, uh, from what I could tell, um, unlike Stockfish, which works on depth, at least on the Wikipedia and other ones, it was stating that your one works far more on evaluation. What was the sort of... Um, design choice there like why why design it along those lines and not along the lines of stockfish where it gets, look, goes into depth for instance as its main source of strength well i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't say the difference is all that uh clear cut it, it, stock stockfish gets a little bit more depth than we do and we put a little bit more emphasis on evaluation but we still get incredible depth, you know, way beyond what the, almost all other programs get. I mean, so it, it's not that dramatic a difference. Fair, fair. Uh, as somebody who d knows 
little about computer theory on that regard. Um, I'll take your word for it on there. So, um, yeah, another thing I suppose which I wanted to cover. Let me just get my notes up real quick on this front here. So, in terms of uh, going to, like, I suppose, the main subject here to an extent, with regards to the limitations of chess, um, and I think it's kind of been highlighted to a large extent by the rise of computers, largely, and also the draw percentage, which I think is only going to increase. But, um, first of all, what do you think the limitations, weaknesses, and sort of strength of, che of chess, the standard game, are? And also... What's your perspective on, for instance, uh, Capablanca's position that, in time, uh, we, a chess is going to undergo the sort of draw death? The idea that, um, at the highest levels, all competent players will eventually end the majority of their fights with just draws. And as a result of that, high-level play will just become non-existent, or at least very hard to see progress to an interesting level. Well, uh, Capablanca was a, a little bit off on his timing. Um, he, he seemed to think that that was right around the corner, and now it's been a, almost a century. And uh, it, it does, it, it, but it is a big problem. The, the, the percentage of draws in, in the, at the world championship level in standard time limit games is, is unacceptably high. So it's something like 80%, maybe. I don't know the exact figure, but something like that. Uh, so, and it's even higher if, for when you have uh, people who like to play correspondence chess, because correspondence chess, they use computers, and then the draw percentage uh, is 90, 95 or something completely ridiculous. Got yeah. I so, that. yeah, so the, 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 the only thing that's actually made chess uh, still somewhat playable, the thing that saved it, is that it's not a fair game. Yeah. White has a real advantage in chess, and that advantage is just enough that it's not an easy draw for black. Mm. It's, it's, it, black should draw, but it, it's not like just do anything and you get a draw. It's not that simple. Mm. So that's why chess is, is still somewhat thriving at the top level. Got ya, got ya. But, but the, the main cure that we're seeing recently, the, the main trend is just to play faster time limits because that reduces the draw percentage. But it also, you know, means that the games are decided by stupid moves. So, you know, is that a good solution? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, th this is an argument that I I've seen online is that with the rise of it, people putting more emphasis on going to bullet chess, etc. Uh, I believe that you mentioned in when we were talking that your solution, or at least one of the things that you uh, were a proponent of, is not uh, allowing moves to be repeated or doubled. I'll have to d double check what the precise. Uh, yeah, just just uh, banning banning repetition. Yeah. Either two or three time or even two time. That that's the detail. That doesn't matter. But if you if you forbid repetition, the draw percentage will drop dramatically. And I'm not. I don't mean because I'm not concerned about repetitions due to the player is not wanting to play. I mean, I know there are draws because they just both want to call it a day and, and go home. But I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about even when you have players who want to fight, it's the normal outcome is is that it's likely to end in a draw and and when it is a draw, it's likely to be a draw by repetition. Got ya. If, if you forbid the repetition, you'll, you'll knock out at least half of the draws right off the bat. Yeah. That that potentially would be indicated. Thoughts on um yeah I could see that potentially, because again yeah my main critique is that at the highest level yeah it, it ends up with a lot of draws and computer suddenly memorization has led to very formulaic games. Opinion on 960 chess because um yeah I know that there's different views on 960 and it's sort of a viability as a tournament format, particularly because some of the positions may give White even more of an advantage. Or disadvantage uh, one side more and also the fact that from a commentating perspective as far as I'm aware commentators have a hard time dealing with 960 chess just because every time some they're playing it it's essentially a new entirely new position for them so there's not much they can really say apart from this looks maybe good he can do this with these moves here it becomes as tricky for them to sort of um, I think engage with the audience 
at least in particular if that audience is used to standard chess. Um, right. The, the the same things that the same things that are the, the uh, pros or the advantages are also it's also a disadvantage that yeah. the, you want to avoid the players playing by memory, but that also means that the commentators don't have anything to rely on. Yeah. So it, 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 that's that's true. Um, I, I have a fair experience with with 960. In fact, I'm I believe I may technically still be the U.S. Open champion because I won the U.S. Open championship of it 10 years ago, and I don't think they hold another one after that. So I I don't know that my title is expired. <laughs> nice. Fair, fair. Well, I'm um, just say bringing so much uh, two things from what Chat said. One, the uh, inventor I told you about earlier, uh, Tomato, is working apparently on a, a variant that will block repetition, uh, which he'll throw up, I presume, onto side chess at some point on pie chess. Um, there was also a question from a shogi player here. I was curious um, how much the language barrier for learning the various different Eastern chess uh, variants, um, with regards to it, um, to what extent has the learning material become more accessible compared to when you yourself learnt them? I certainly think it probably increased massively, I would imagine. Um, almost certainly. <laughs> yeah, when, when, I, when I first learned Shogi, basically the only English uh, language was, there was one magazine that came out monthly from England. That was it. Uh, now there's just a vast amount. There's even a bunch of stuff on the internet by me on, <laughs> in, in English on, uh, on Shogi. Definitely. So, Definitely. Yeah. So there's no no yeah. It's a, probably a uh, hundred times as much as there was when I was learning. Mm -hmm. So um, another interesting question. So you mentioned previously, and this is one that I, I I tried to look up anything on this, and I could find uh, basically nothing. But uh, Walter Brown. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing Gade his surname correctly there. I apologize if I'm not. But um, finesse chess, you mentioned you'd played before. And looking into a finesse chess, I could find literally nothing on it anywhere. On even sites that try to document um, variants and uh, variant forms. So, what was finesse chess, if uh, you wouldn't mind? What's the idea behind it? Well, this is Walter Brown's invention. Uh, and he was a friend of mine, and um, he uh, convinced me to to learn the game. Uh, and um, it, he was planning to do something with it. He was planning to start mass producing sets and promoting it. But he he died suddenly. You know, he was he, he died in the '60s, and uh, you know he wasn't. He had some health problems, but he wasn't. Nobody thought he was about to die. Uh, so that, and apparently nobody did anything with it after he died. That was just the end of it. Uh, but it, 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 the idea of it, all of the pieces were moved differently, and they and they were all they all had animal names. You know, like the uh, one was named that, like a frog or a, you know different different animals, and uh, they uh, he tried to make it. He, he felt it was a little more dynamic than chess, a little more active. You know, the pieces were a little more mobile, generally speaking. Mm. So he uh, he taught me to play, and uh, and also my son, who's an international master. And uh, at some point, uh, when we were all in San Francisco, um, he, he put together a tournament. Uh, yeah, six-player round ro double round robin of, of this game, and uh, he was surprised because I won. <laughs> he, he was expecting to win his own tournament. Oh, of course, you know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> he came in second, and my son was third. <laughs> nice, very nice. Yeah, I can imagine that. But he seemed a very interesting person. From from what I've read up on him, he seemed a very interesting uh, person. I said uh, I particularly like the one quote I could find from him, uh, which was. If Bobby Fischer is the god of chess, then I am the devil. I found that to be a very good quote. <laughs> yeah, that sounds uh, sounds like something he would say. Uh -huh. <laughs> very nice, very good. Um, so, in terms of other stuff on that front, uh, one end, a question that just came from there: What would you consider the highlight of your career, whether as a whole or uh, individually to chess? But I suppose what was both the highlight and most memorable moment uh, so far? I would say. Well, it's difficult to pick 
one thing that I've had so many um, amazing things. I mean, I guess my most impressive, uh, you know, result or title would be the winning the World Senior Championship in chess. But uh, I mean, I've also had some very major uh, wins in shogi. I uh, won the North American Championship and got the, the rank of five don. And I came second only to the Japanese in an in a international championship uh, in shogi. And then in, in computer chess, we've, we've won the world championship several times, but that, that's a team event. Of course, that's not just me. You know, that's, uh, I'm uh, part of the team there. Sure. Uh, so then I guess my, my, my first big uh, thing, big uh, moment in chess was winning the American Open Championship in 1966. That was very memorable. And, uh, playing, I played in four U.S. championships. There's a lot of memories from that. <laughs> so it's hard to pick out one, one thing. I've had so many, so many interesting uh, things in, in my, my life. Yeah, no, it, it, it seems so. I mean, I think out of professional chess players, you're probably unique in the fact that you have focused on so many different board games. I don't know of, as far as I know, anyone else who has achieved a level of proficiency, not only with chess and shogi, but also Go, Korean chess, Chinese chess, etc., etc. Um, it's even, for example, and again, Creative S Chess, or one of the uh, Creative S Chess, um, primarily, of course, focuses on chess, but also has his own version of S Chess. But as far as I'm aware, he doesn't try or hasn't attempted to try Chinese, Chinese chess or Go or any of the others. Um, certainly not on a competitive level. So um, it's very impressive. Um, and yeah, that's all I can say. I, I, I think it's incredible what you've managed to achieve um, on that front. And on top of that, working on the computer aspect as well, just the amount that it's been dedicated towards the chess world and you've contributed is kind of crazy. Amazing, but kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, so on that front there, so we've previously talked about, um, let's have a look. Have you tried, there are two other variants which I have been experimenting with as well, and if you haven't played them, fair enough, um, but have you ever tried or heard of Omega Chess? Or, and another one is Tencube. Those are two that we've encountered recently, or I've discovered, which uh, seem fairly interesting. I'm particularly fascinated with um, Omega Chess at the moment. I've heard of it, but I have not. Fair, fair. Um, it's, uh, I think, kind of interesting. It adds an additional piece of... And it's got the Archbishop and the Chancellor on there anyway, but it has another unit called the the Wizard, which essentially moves one diagonal and three forwards in any direction, or horizontal. Um, it's kind of fascinating. I, I think it leads to a lot of... Um, it feels probably out of the ones I've played the most like a standard game of chess, but with just additional pieces. Um, so at some point, I, uh, if you're ever curious about that, do check out the, the, uh, the sites I linked to, because that that's pretty good. Um, on that front, I suppose, as well, with regards to... So we've covered what the future potentially... I mean, do you think that FIDE, uh, FIDE will... And I believe that's pronunciation of the of the chess association's title or name i can never pronounce it correctly but do you think because fide took immense pressure to get them to accept 960 chess as a variant and i believe it's the only other officially recognized variant in the world at the moment do you think that um in time they will add on any others uh, and the winds are slowly changing they're becoming more open to that or do you get the impression that that was just primarily due to Kind of the death of Bobby Fischer. I believe it was added around 2000 and I want to say like 2007, 8 ish around that time, but I might be completely wrong on that front. But um, just as a kind of a tribute to him. Because um, it strikes me that they seem very reluctant to do or add anything that might, in their eyes, dilute the game of chess. Well, they. Yes, that's probably a generally an accurate statement. They they have shown a little bit of openness to to uh, minor thing changes in the rule. They, for example, they they actually rated a tournament at where they played with the rule that 
stalemate counts as three quarters of a point. Mm. And I would not have thought that would be allowed for rating, but they, they apparently <laughs> somebody made the decision that they would allow that. Uh, so that's, I mean, that that's a fairly major change. You know, mm. it's not it's not day and night, but it's it's, it's a fairly big change. Yeah. So they, they they seem to be somewhat open to to some changes, but mm. I I don't know about you know I don't think they're just going to start recognizing variants all over the place. Of they, course. They, yeah. You know, yeah. They, because there is a dilution. There there is that, that and that that's a valid concern. I mean, if you, the more variants that people play, it means there are that f fewer people playing any one of them. Yeah. That is a concern. That's that's a valid point. That's true. That's true. I suppose. I yeah. I I think it's got a while. I think in time, perhaps. I think that they'll pro uh, one proposition for nine sixty chess. I saw them. Uh, one. I think might be in, might be Kaspar who raised it. I'd have to check. But he, he one proposition he had for it in the tournament was to at the start of the year, if Fide chose two of the nine hundred sixty positions as tournament openings. And then, you know, played every competition of 960 using that opening. And then next year, they chose another. Because that would give people a chance to, you know, prep some openings and also have some see some f familiarity. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, but I, think, I think the uh, consensus is opposed to that because that basically puts us back that having people use computers to prepare uh, their rooms. True, true, <laughs> true. Yeah, that's fair. In terms of, um, so at the highest levels of chess, because again, I don't find, find that many grandmasters, at least as far as I can tell, are interviews, but from personal experience, at least, how many of like top ranked players do you think have at one point or another experimented with or do enjoy some forms of variance um, to a large extent or like experiment? Because it doesn't seem, again, that common, but you do spot people here and there um, who have sort of, you know, played them, I suppose. Well, I, I have taught a lot of grandmasters and international masters how to play shogi, but not, you count that as a variant, that's, that's another game, but um, I would say a fairly modest percentage of grandmasters have an interest in variants. I mean, some of them like one or two variants. I, I think some, of course, the bug house is relatively popular, yes. and, and then the 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 two-person version, Crazy House, has got some popularity. Yes, yes. Um, that's, that's fair. A bug House, uh, yeah, there's a fair, I've encountered a fair few Bug House players and Crazy House players. The issue I find with um, Bug House is partly that you can lose due to your partner, so it seems very, uh, very stressful for a start, and also somewhat mildly occasionally rage-inducing, maybe. For uh, stronger players who get paired with weak ones, at least not on the non-competitive scene, um, I think competitively, you know, you'd work with your partner a lot more to kind of uh, develop what you're going to do, know what not to take, etc. Um, uh, so one question that's come in is uh, what the reception of the general reception of other grandmasters or high-level chess players has been to being taught uh, shogi, and based on what you said, it seems that they were fairly open to it, at least, and. Uh, I presume found it relatively interesting. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I taught it quite a few. I even taught Victor Korchnoi, but uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, most of them probably didn't follow up on it. I mean, I taught them the rules, and I don't know what they did or didn't do after that. But uh, a couple of them did stick with it to, to some extent. Mm. But I, I don't, I don't think any of the people that I taught. Any, I mean, any of the, the players I taught who were titled players at the time, I don't think any of them really became strong uh, shogi players. There, there are a couple of grandmasters who've taken up shogi on their own uh, in recent years, and, and particularly Peter Hein Nielsen is uh, probably the uh, the one who's achieved the most success in, among people who've learned it in the current century. Got you. Got you. Fair. Um, yeah, interesting. No, inter so, um, I think that's fairly interesting. I mean, like, um, yeah, I'll see if any other questions come in. In terms of other stuff there, so if out of all, uh, discounting Shogi, as we've said, it's a different game, if you were to 
what out of all the primary variants that you have played would you rate as the highest chess variant or certainly the most enjoyable for yourself and um yeah well i mean i i like I do like Fisher Random Chess 960 because it's it's basically chess with a different start position. Mm. It st still feels like I'm playing a game of chess. It doesn't feel like I'm playing some other. It doesn't feel like a variant because the rules are the same except for the little detail about cashling. Mm -hmm. But so you might not even want to call it a variant. It's almost like just a different start position. But uh, as far as the actual variants, um, I I would probably say. S chess is the one that I was maybe the most into, mm. which is very closely related to Capablanca chess or, yeah. you know, Gothic chess. They're all they're all the same extra two pieces. It's just the details are different. Yeah, I, I certainly think that S chess is, and I agree with again the the creator of S chess. I, I don't want to butcher his name, so I won't try. But the creator of S chess's uh, perspective on it is that. It's a lot more accessible than Capablanca chess due to the ease at which people can find standard boards. And I, I certainly, as I mentioned, think that that's always been, was always the downfall of Capablanca, or Capablanca's chess, is that because he didn't mass produce the boards and he didn't really send them out across the country to various chess clubs, the variant suffered heavily. Because without that, you didn't have people playing it or trying it out. You didn't have a sort of a base whereby people could acquire it without having to get it custom made. And it seems that that is a major problem with variants and forms of chess that deviate from the eight by sort of eight layout, um, which S chess solves pretty well, pretty well, um, for sure. Hmm. Yeah, in fact, we, we uh, ma made a version of our Komodo program to, to play S chess. We, this, this was about uh, eight years ago and we, we were given a contract to do this, to, to make a an S chess program. Mm -hmm. So we, we did it and, uh, and then there, since there was no other program out there at the time, uh, the, the only way we could actually show that we'd, we'd made a good program was we had it play a match with Yasser Sarawan himself. <laughs> and uh, the, I remember the the first game, there was a bug in the program and it blundered a piece, and, and it still got a, a draw by perpetual check. Oh, interesting. And How then we fixed then we fixed the bug and played another ten games over the next month or so, and the computer won all all of those games. How how did he uh, take to that? Uh, was he a good sport about it? Oh yeah, yeah. He 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 knew that computers were going to beat humans if they were programmed properly. I mean, yeah. it was just a question of whether we did a good job or not, and we did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I, S chess is definitely something I want to get into, um, and I need to look up more about it. I need to play more matches. The one I've played the most of is Grand Chess, and following that, some of the other ones we've also tried. I've kind of enjoyed Circular Chess, the idea of going off one side of the board and coming back on the other. I don't think it would be necessarily that feasible, but it fundamentally changes how a, ch a game of chess is played, because you can very quickly pin the uh, D and E pawns to their squares, with also the C and F pawns to their squares, because otherwise they can result in you know, bishops taking the queen or the king very quickly. Um, I think that's been one of the more fun variants I've played. We've also played some of the uh, different sized boards but they tend to be uh, quite um disorientating for people who are used to normal sized boards for sure i think uh, accessibility is a big problem um with certainly the variation it's why i've got a lot of hopes for kind of uh, certain sites which have been coming along and also in time maybe s chess if, if there were more competitions organized with s chess for instance um i think it would be it, it probably would pick up relatively fast, I imagine. Um, I can't imagine it'd be too tricky to uh, sort of do that, necessarily. But yeah, as I mentioned to you, I think that another thing that stops the growth of them online, to an extent, not necessarily 960, because Chess.com and both Lee Chess have that, but as a result of the way that those sites sponsor certain people, you're limited to the variants that are on those sites. Um, because 
when they sponsor a high level player, they only allow them to play on that site, um, at least whenever they're uh, showing it off, which kind of means that for a lot of like the new people who have since COVID-19 sort of been online watching chess, etc., it's, uh, they're kind of very much unaware of those, but they were almost, they were unaware of them previously, I suppose, as well. Um, I guess, I guess, I guess. So here's another question I have then, and it's one I've been considering. Why, um, as a fan of so many variants, have you ever considered making a variant yourself or coming up with your own version of chess? Well, I've, I'm a big, uh, proponent of, of rule changes. I mean, whether you call them variants or just, just rule changes is a matter of opinion. I, I mean, I, I feel like it's very necessary to address the draw problem in chess. So I, I, mean, it, I, I propose a lot of different solutions. I mean, we already mentioned the repetition one, but I, there's a, other versions that uh, I propose too that address the problem. One, one of the other ones I'm kind of a big advocate of is um, uh, we call it N N NBSC, no, no black short castling. Uh, the idea is black can't castle short, but he wins if it's a draw. Got you. I understand. And we've 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 tested this very thoroughly with computers, and we found that it's an incredibly fair game. It's just it just turns out to be remarkably well balanced. The 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 loss of short castling by black and the that getting winning draws is makes the game perfectly fair. Interesting. Yeah, Very for that. One, uh, one question that's uh, sort of coming as well is, do you think um, do you think that in terms of the promotion of shogi and Chinese chess, it would be advantageous for the federations of those um, chess, organize, for those chess-like games to, for instance, use uh, international symbols as opposed to the Chinese and Japanese characters to promote those uh, games and to make them far more accessible. Because I, I feel that similar to, as we've discussed before previously, some forms of variance, I think that accessibility is a big problem. Um, and that's why S-Chess is one of the best ones because it is so easy to get into. Because um, you don't have to... The two new pieces, same board though, same starting position, one rule change with the drops, uh, but with Shogi, certainly whenever I've tried showing it on stream before, I find that a lot of people, because they don't recognize the symbols and find a lot of them kind of hard to read, um, people, I think, get kind of turned off or scared away from those games, despite them being, in my view, su superior games. Certainly Shogi, I, uh, I've had this argument and I agree with you on that. I think it is just a better game. Um, because it's certainly more long drawn, for instance. But uh, yeah, we agree fundamentally on that, one hundred percent. Anyway, so that's the question. Do you think the international uh, symbols would be a plus or a sort of negative to those games? I suppose. Well, they. I mean, shogi. Uh, there certainly are shogi sets, sets you can get that are that have international characters on them, and I. I suppose they're. I'm not sure about all the websites, but some of them might even have have an option to display the pieces with uh, international. So I, I I agree, it's nice to have that option. I mean, in my case, I I didn't want to learn because of the, that exact reason. I mean, it was very annoying to have to learn a game where the, where I couldn't read any of the pieces. But it was I'm glad I did because if I had learned in the English, I I mean I I could never have gone to Japan and never. Have, Never played the uh, all the great players that I got to play, so it, it was it was a a price well worth paying. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I mean, um, and I think it's not once once you begin recognizing them, it's not too hard. It's just that initial accessibility, I think, uh, for sure. Um, one non-chess question, sort of, sort of related to chess, but that was raised in chat. Out of everywhere you've been um, around the world for various competitions, various tournaments, etc. Where would you say is the place you would like to go to again, or has been the most enjoyable to visit? It's not quite chess related, but it's a nice question, so why not? Uh, in general, I think I, I enjoyed Japan a lot. That would that, that probably near the top of my list. I, uh, yeah, I visited twice uh, Kyoto and Tokyo, uh, and I'm a big, big fan of Kyoto. Um, 
I think it's a, a very interesting place and uh, there's certainly a lot to do there. Um, I find it very calm. Yeah, I don't really know if I have much else. I th we've covered a vast amount, I suppose, um, in terms of things. So we've covered uh, what forms of variants your views on shogi, for instance. We've covered uh, Chinese chess to an extent, your history of it. Stockfish, uh, to an extent, the Komodo engine. I suppose, um, to an extent, like, was, in terms of the Komodo engine and your interest in that, I presume that just all your interest in computer programming was sparked. Oh, well, that's a good question. Yeah. Where did your interest in uh, computer programming and chess engines sort of originate from? Um, yeah. Oh, that's that's uh, because I, when I was a student at MIT in in the 1960s, they were de developing the very first chess program to ever compete in a human chess tournament, and I had just won the American Open Chess Championship, and I was a student there, so they hired me as the the chess guy for the project. Got ya. Got ya. Interesting. Um, de fair, fair. Well, I think, yeah, apart from that, I don't know if I, I've uh, got too many others. Um, to an extent, I suppose, not a subject I know vast amounts on, necessarily, but um, chess engines, from what I understand, I mean, you were talking about earlier about evaluation and depth. Um, do you think that the kind of, uh, that the concepts around, like, neuro uh, networks and things, and the kind of, uh, those forms of computer learning that we're beginning to see certainly pick up a lot of pace now, um, I mean, do you think, uh, are there many engines that you know of that use those methodologies at the moment, I suppose? Um, like neural networks? Again, I'm not a computer person, so I don't know if yours already does. Um, uh, okay, well, the answer is yes. Um, so, the, uh, until fairly, until a few months ago, it, it was, um, there was one group of programs that used it, that, uh, LC0 being or Leela being the best known one, I guess. And, but they all required uh, a, a graphics processor unit, GPU, to, oh, yeah. to, to, do a, to be strong. But then very recently, uh, a technique was developed for Shogi, not for chess, but for Shogi, oh. uh, in, called NNUE, which involves using neural networks in standard chess programs that don't have GPUs. Or shogi, well, shogi program. So they they put they made a shogi program with this NNUE technique, and it was just incredibly strong. It was much better than any other shogi program or any human or anything. And then uh, it it was taken up by Stockfish for chess, and and Stockfish 12 came out just a few weeks ago with this NNUE. Mm -hmm. And now the question is, can we get it into Komodo? <laughs> got ya, got ya. Uh, so another question that's come in from somebody who I know it has some interest in computers to an extent. Um, do you think that eventually computer engines will plateau in skill? Um, and if they do plateau in skill and end up at this point where they can't advance, will humans then be able to catch up to that point? I mean, yeah, so that that's the question which has been asked. Um, um, well, I can certainly say no to the second part. People will never catch up with computers. There's no, no way. But uh, as for plateauing, it, there it's a matter of you have to define the, the uh, terms because what we might get to a point where the computers can draw uh, pretty much all the time. So you, you might say it's plateauing in the sense that computer might get to be good enough that another computer just can't beat it hardly ever. Mm -hmm. But still, there will be a big difference in their skill in terms of how they will play if if given a position that's not an obvious draw. Got in other words, if you, if, if you start the game in an unclear position, one of them will still play much better than the other. So in one sense, they're pla they may plateau, but in another sense, no. Got you. I understand. Fair? Well... I uh, I think that basically covers everything. Then, <laughs> unless uh, chat, you guys have any other questions you want me to ask? Um, I certainly think that I've exhausted probably what I can ask with regards to um, 
uh, regards to variants, etc. at the moment, and certainly computers, which, again, not my uh, sort of expertise necessarily. Um, I just, I guess, would like to say thank you um, for agreeing to come on. Oh, yeah, when the game gets solved, yeah. Um, I think, um, so yeah, thank you for coming on, and I would, uh, one simple question, oh, we can ask that question, I suppose. Uh, in terms of preference for or a GM, Magnus or Hikaru? That's a question that's been asked. And there's another one after that. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean who are they asking who's a better chess player or oh, who do well, I like better? I, I, <laughs> I, 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 they haven't specified, so I guess it's uh, up to you there. <laughs> well, I mean, it's pretty clear that Magnus is number one and Hikaru is, may, is number two in fast chess and, mm -hmm. and somewhat low, slow chess. So, I mean, Magnus is the best player, but uh, Hikaru is maybe uh, more entertaining. <laughs> okay. They're both entertaining, though. Oh, I they're both, like both of them, actually. And I don't really know Magnus personally, but I know Hikaru pretty well. We've played several times. Nice. Very nice. Um, another question. Uh, what is a f your favorite era of chess, if you have a favorite era? Mm, probably the Morphe era, because I, I grew up, you know, reading his games and that somehow I was entranced by mm. that uh, that period. And that leads to a, like, a question I was going to ask as well, is that who, who do you think was your biggest influence, certainly with regards to chess? And I, I guess it would just to be uh, sort of a Morphe there. Um, with regards well, not, to, not, uh, not really. I mean, they, Morphe would be the biggest influence at first, when I, but, but later on, it, I, would, I would say it was Bobby Fischer was my main Fischer. Name. Got you. Got you. And I knew him too. I met him several times. I, I, did, I never got to play him a game, though, but... Uh, hmm. but talk a few times <laughs> nice nice what um with regards to shogi did you have any influence or like a uh, preference like yeah either in a, an influence with regards to a shogi player or uh, dan in regards to that um or did you just generally absorb information from across the place or do you find that there is a shogi player whose style you kind of have learned most from Mm, possibly uh, Oyama. He, o, Oyama was the uh, the greatest player in the 1950s and 60s, and I actually got to play him three times around 1990, be right before he died. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I would say he was possibly the biggest influence on me. Awesome, awesome. Well, um, thank you very much, Larry. I guess uh, unless. I'll give chat one more chance to ask questions. If not, though, there, I'll uh, let you be, I suppose. Uh, if, <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. I'll give them, like, I'll give them, like, a minute if they like anything. Um, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I think uh, another one. Oh, another type of uh, chess at some point. Oh, thoughts on, have you ever played Fog of War chess? Um, no, no, I have not. It's on uh, chess.com on their uh, variant section, but... Uh, yeah, I've seen, I've seen it mentioned, yes. It's uh, fairly interesting, though. I think it's... Uh, I'm not sure necessarily how... How, like, rand... How much it could be praised because of how random it is at times. Because you can just get a similar to bullet chess, a lot of blunders. But uh, it's quite fun. It's quite fun. Um... I certainly think that out of the variants they put up recently, it's probably the most popular, um, and I can see why, just because it's very enjoyable. So, uh, should, uh, thanks for everyone for the time, blah, blah. So yes, uh, I think that's going to be it. I think everyone here, everyone in chat is just saying thank you very much for being here and uh, for sharing your thoughts and perspectives, uh, because you are very much, whether you know it or not, you're, you're certainly considered to be something of a legend within the chess community. and. Uh, so thank you very much, um, I suppose. Yes. And uh, have a good evening. I hope your back gets better um, from what you were saying earlier. And um, I hope you have a good day, really. Um, yes. Thank you. See you around, yeah. man. Hey, I enjoyed it. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Thank you. Hey. Bye-bye now. Well, there we go, chat. What a legend. <laughs> what a legend. I'm going to call it there. I have to, like, destroy certain scenes, but what a legend. What a legend. Um, yeah. That's what I can really say to that. What an interesting guy. That was very fascinating. I hope everyone's had fun. I think that was very fun. 
it wasn't that long, about an hour long though, but, well, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I did amazingly well, I was kind of terrified about talking to him. You may, you could maybe have t told from my, like, uh, not, sort of stammering to an extent, <laughs> that at times I was a bit terrified, but, um, very approachable guy. I will see if I can get him to play any of your games, Couch. I'll give him a poke. Um, and I'm certainly going to upload that to YouTube and other stuff, but um, I hope that um, that was what. If any of you have any questions, throw them my way, and I'll throw it his way, and uh, just poke me about that. Um, yeah. I think I'll call stream there, though, uh, because my overlay is utterly destroyed as a result of trying to get Skype to work. Um... So yeah, but thank you everyone for turning up. I found that very good fun. And um, yeah, that was awesome. And thank you to everyone who followed. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I hope I asked the questions you wanted to... Um, <laughs> wanted. And Derp, I would have asked him if he wanted to be an emote, but I don't think he knows what an emote is. And I didn't want to confuse him. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that, that's my reason for that there. But uh, maybe hate me for writing theory. Anyway, I'm gonna head off. Enjoy your evenings. I might pop onto your guys' streams if you're uh, if anyone's streaming. Check out Quaglon here. He streams. Check out Chess on Earth here. He streams. Uh, check them out. They're both lovely people. If you want to play fun games, Couch Tomato here is an inventor of chess games. Give him a poke. He's an awesome guy. And I might be able to get another GM on soon. Maybe. Uh, we're looking at the other GM who might be coming on sometime this week, depending on factors, is going to be... And this isn't finalised yet, chap, so we'll see. But the other GM I've got coming on, possibly, is Josh Friedel, who's another person who's played some variants before. So GM Josh Friedel. Not quite such a hyper super legend, but a cool guy all the same. And with that... I'm going to head off. Ciao, ciao. If you know of any IMs, GMs, or NMs, or anyone else who would like to play or talk or anything, give me a shout or poke them my way and uh, let's do it. And we all learnt a lesson here. Chess legends prefer Magnus. Mm, let it be known across the Twitters. Ciao, ciao, people. Ciao, ciao.